Hi, Julian, and welcome to Queer Magic. It's great to have you on. So I know you as author of most recently Chaos Craft with Steve D and lots of other books on chaos magic and magic and paganism in general. So anything else you want to add? Oh, well, firstly, Yvonne, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, I think we were just saying, I, I frankly can't remember. I think it's like 14 or 15 different books now, and they're, they're all pretty much about sort of uh, magic in one form or another, although there's one which is for people who work in museums and galleries, um, which at least overtly isn't about magic, but it is about evoking curiosity and uh, asking people to, inviting people to, uh, explore museum and gallery objects uh, in order to discover new things about the world in themselves. So I guess it's also at the end of the day about, you know, transformation, let's call it. Yes, absolutely. Yes, my pet peeve about museums and galleries is that the the way that the captions on things are completely inaccessible. Um, so yeah, good. Yeah. Sounds good. There is, there is there is work being done in that field to address that. And I think that I think it's kind of nice because, you know, museum the very word itself means shrine to the muses that's what it means yes and so it should be a shrine to the muses for everyone who enters the the space um but finding good ways to engage people with those objects and those collections and those stories that's kind of what i do professionally so um uh yeah it's a work in progress awesome yeah well i touch on accessibility with my web stuff so that's how I got interested in that particular area plus yeah. going to a museum going to many museums with a person who has dyslexia and observing the increasing frustration with the, the captions <laughs> so um because you have to cross reference between the numbers and the the numbers on the caption and the number on the object just put the caption next to the object ah uh, yeah yeah so there you go and and more of a poetic evocation of what the object is about would be good mm -hmm. too so mm -hmm. yeah so on to the the topic of queer magic um so uh, a bit about you and how long you've been involved in paganism and and parts adjacent. Um, I think about I think we probably entered on the pagan scene about the same time. So. So, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm 52. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, oh, right, okay, great. That's that's us just made it over over half a century thus far. Yes. Um, and I first, I mean, I was, I've always been interested in magic. So even just like as a really little kid, I was kind of reading around lots of stuff. I, I um, voraciously devoured all of the stuff in my local library um, that I could possibly find um, uh, when I was, I don't know, yeah, in my early teens, pre-teens. Um, and I kind of got involved with uh, Wicca when I was about 16 um and started working in uh with a a, a kind of um a sort of exploratory kind of environment of of the craft which had a kind of background within the alexandrian stream of uh, initiation but we were quite we were yeah quite a kind of experimental so we did um uh, a lot of kind of creating our own kind of ritual practice that's myself and and um my partner at the time catherine summers so um really from that time i've been involved quite a lot in in group magical practice you know working with all kinds of lovely people you know from um contemporary uh, druids and pagans of various stripes you know thelemic magic um and then also having opportunities to work with people from various kind of different um different styles and different backgrounds particularly folk from uh india and um a little bit in nepal uh, and then the the Americas, uh, particularly as my interest in uh, psychedelics and entheogenics has kind of grown. A lot of those communities have got you know long lineages of practice within um, those domains. So I've been doing quite a lot of kind of work over the the last I guess two decades, something like this, with with within that kind of uh, culture. I suppose a lot of my work tends to be um, around. This idea of chaos magic, which I'm sure people listen to this know, you know, style of magic or an approach to magic developed in the in Europe in the latter part of the 20th century, drawing on things like discordianism, crazy wisdom, punk DIY culture, uh, and those kinds of things. Um, but my first experience of magic was very much within the context of Wicca, within the context of the, the craft. That was 
that was the kind of thing that in the what would that have been the 80s i guess that, I, that was most accessible to me so that's that's basically where i started yeah yeah so yeah you're probably about five years ahead of me because i started um around about 1989 and then got initiated to, into wicca in 91 so yeah um i just certainly remember seeing you know in my early years early pagan experiences like oh there's another article by julian bain <laughs> so <laughs> yeah that's i mean that's the other thing that i really i i enjoy writing and 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 it's and um like with the stuff in museums actually it's part of my interest is in uh accessibility and uh so when i learn a thing um i like to also kind of figure out well how might i share this thing productively with other people uh ain't no one in this job for the money uh really which is how come the day job is still a thing but um yeah i really enjoy writing i uh, i enjoy that kind of um means of expression and it's as close to uh or it's one of the strands i suppose i think of as as uh my um, if you like artistic practice, you know, it's, it, I, to, to create something that communicates ideas to people that maybe kind of inspires them in, in, in some degree, hopefully, um, and allows them to reflect in their own way and develop their own practice. Um, that's something I like to try and try and achieve with the writing that I produce. Yeah, and I certainly found the writing style very, you know, I love reading your blog and in, um, very accessible stuff. So, yeah succeeded um yeah that's awesome so uh tell us a bit about your position on the queer landscape as it were i just i was thinking about that and i was thinking about um that that whole um i mean i i like i like the use of the term queer because i think that the um the for me it points to that idea of like a uh, uh, fluidity of identity um, and if I think about my own kind of experience, then I um, have had, uh, you know, intimate, uh, uh, romantic, let's call it relationships with men and with uh, women, and have um, had those kind of, very, I'm very interested in the, the, um, the way that in magic, a lot of those kind of queer identity things, which I kind of feel as a person, uh, appear within the uh, a lot of the kind of the the tradition of the corpus of, of material um, and and also the way that some of those things are thrown into question and are, are seen perhaps in some quarters as kind of problematic um, so yeah I mean where do I kind of put myself I put myself in this moving shifting space where my own kind of um, uh, you know I mean, broadly speaking, if I, if I, you know, if I had to fill in the form and it says, what gender are you? I say I'm male because that's just kind of convenient and makes makes sense in terms of my own biological um, uh, or organization and sense of uh, uh, kind of self. But it also, I also kind of wryly smile when I put the tick in the box because I think, yeah, I mean, you know, there are, like with any kind of, uh, any system of um, describing things, uh they work up these things work up to a point and so the queer identity for me is something that points towards this fluidity of um uh, relationship and identity both in my own personal story and in the stories i observe within other people and within kind of broader uh, communities so i don't know if that really answers it i mean yeah. I, I, you know it's totally yeah. cool i think that's a beautiful way of putting it and uh, um you know one doesn't have to say right okay i'm in i'm in this label or whatever it's you know because if you feel that your your identity is shifting then that's that's you know proper queer that is <laughs> so yeah, it's good yeah yeah, yeah 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 totally um all right so here's a hard one well actually i know you've done this because i watched your video um the, at the cauldron of the queer the other day and it was it was very good uh so your definite sort of broad brush definition of queer magic okay so if we think about if we think about um magic to start with um i think of magic as the you know in a variety of different ways it's often said that there are at least as many definitions of magic as there are magical practitioners and probably more definitions because no single definition can be fully uh, inclusive or 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 um, 
a, cl a closed, it can't produce a closed loop. So magic is all kinds of things. Magic is our response to a moment of experience, you know, where, where, where you know, something happens, which might be an everyday event, you know, a sunrise. And we experience that as a kind of a magical event. There's some quality about that that is deeply um, uh, evocative and transformative. And magic, I, I often describe as the, the technology of the imagination. So it's a way of using a variety of different sort of approaches to engage with the human imagination, to explore um, uh, how we are and, what, and how we might be, uh, and to affect changes that are inside and outside. So then if we think about the idea of kind of queer magic, well, what would that mean? Um, I think for me that that would um, mean a variety of different layers, depending on where we want to kind of pitch it, um, in a really uh, a, a straightforward, pragmatic sense, what it would mean would be to look at the magical tradition and identify those elements within it, uh, either historical or contemporary, where those fluid ideas about uh, gender and sexuality and identity more broadly, um, where those things appear. And they appear in all kinds of mythological structures, they appear in lots of, um, of ritual systems, um, and again there are systems from which they are or appear to be kind of excluded. Um, and I think that the idea of queerness, going back to what I said earlier, is that for me it's about this kind of um, uh, yeah fluid fluidity and flexibility and if we're going to use magic to change things then being able to occupy that place where we find um, the, the the fluid boundary the uncertain boundary the and also the way that the word queer also points at things you know like uh, words like uh, like weird yeah which of course mm. has its roots in kind of the you know, those Anglo-Saxon lovely Anglo-Saxon word um, where there's a strangeness, there's a there's a there's a um, something that escapes the standard kind of definitions, and that for me I think is where this um, some of this kind of uh, these these points intersect. So, for example, if you look at um, the uh, if we go to a, a mythological structure, we look at uh, Norse mythology, and we see the figure of our kind of um, primal a uh, shaman in the form of Odin. Yeah. And we look at that legend. Yeah, exactly. We know we both know the story. We look at that legend. We look at how Odin, um, rather like a Paul Atreides off of Dune, uh, manages to get both the sort of, the, if you like, the, the quote, men's magic of, of Galda and the runes and risking the runes and all that kind of stuff. And also uh, an engagement and um, uh, the, the the kind of power of the female magic, you know, the safe craft magic, the trance magic. The interesting thing about that, of course, is that just from a kind of very, um, a, a very kind of physical uh, way of reading this, if trance magic involves a spirit coming inside a person, that can be quite easily kind of conceptualized uh, as a kind of a, a penetration or yeah. an absorption, right? And obviously within uh, as I understand it, some of the, uh, uh, the the kind of Norse communities or Viking sort of cultures, um, male homosexuality, particularly passive male homosexuality, was seen as a terribly bad thing. You know, it was it was it was it was not highly regarded. Yeah, and, same uh, for the Greeks as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. But nevertheless, our primal shaman um, exemplifies and and the languages used about our our primal shaman uh, Odin. Um, which is about exactly that. It's about yeah. He that. was called Ergi by by other gods. So yeah, exactly, exactly. Which is which is you know uh, uh, this this uh, term which is like a, a an, an outlaw um, uh, 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 essentially sort of a, a abusive term in terms of what we would identify as as you know uh, homosexuality. Mm. But, but I think it's being reclaimed in the same way oh, yeah, as yeah. queer, right? So totally, and in the same way that witch has, and in the same mm -hmm. way, you know, um, other words um, been, that have been used pejoratively against, you know, um, uh, black communities or people of color have also been reclaimed. You know, it's very, very powerful magic to do that, and even so, right there within that sort of tradition, within this kind of, as I understand it, fairly sort of heteronormative kind of culture. You have this queerness, you have this weirdness, you have this strangeness, you have this kind of outsiderness, and you have this 
destabilization of what otherwise would be a kind of very macho kind of role you know this dude spears himself on a tree and he shrieks and he carries up the runes and all of that sort of stuff that it provides like another side of what's going on another aspect of what's going on and it it, it also you know arguably throws into question some of those cultural norms that that um, persisted at the time and as you rightly say are being now reclaimed and changed by people in uh, in, in the modern age yeah um so so yeah those are some of the some of the some of the thoughts about yeah it, as they i love it themselves in my brain now <laughs> I particularly liked uh, magic as the technology of the imagination. Um, I think that's that's really great. I'm going to quote that. Uh, and also, I think the you know queer meaning going across something like against the grain, um, or like the sense of transgression, um, and being on the boundaries and pushing to, to the edge and finding out what's on the edge. Um, I mean, we know this, don't we? We see, we see within magic that there is a, a an emphasis on um, uh, because it's about change. In order for a change to happen, there has to be a movement from one state to another, and in order for that to happen, there is there is potentially a kind of a, a liminal zone where one thing is becoming another, where the um, uh, one color, if you like, is shading off into another in the rainbow, and so that uh, sense of um, uh, liminality, that kind of transition, uh, transition, transgression, crossing over, uh, which magic itself implies, yeah. I think is kind of embodied within those notions of kind of queer identity. And it also becomes, of course, in, it, very intensely personal for people because this is about, you know, um, who they who they love uh, or what how their relationships are configured or how their attitudes are to themselves and their own body or how their body is understood within kind of wider culture and, and, and um, how that body is read, you know, made sense of by the people that they encounter. Mm. So um, thinking about magic as being something that is this kind of slippery kind of quality that is um, like the human imagination. It's, you know, capable of both being um, uh, both, both being something which can be uh, misled, uh, and also something which is an inevitable precondition to uh, to do things like to to learn and to expand one's field of possible uh, activity in the world. So that kind of slippery, uncertainty kind of quality, I think, is what magic is about. And um, yeah, that's very much reflected in in ideas about uh, and experiences of being queer. Yeah, and actually, you know, I would go so far as to say that magic is inherently queer. And being queer is inherently magical, or at least if if it's a Venn diagram, the, there's quite a big overlap between the two domains. I mean, we see it, don't we? We see, you know, we know that. Um, I mean, it's it's a, it's we can generalize about these things in a way that maybe misses some of the fine kind of cultural grain, but we can certainly look at um, uh, the figures of. Uh, and again, the language is problematic inevitably, but we can look at kind of, you know, shamanism, we can look at um, various forms of religion where there is this kind of um, this destabilization of, of, the, of, the, of the boundaries on the part of those kind of practitioners, you know, mm. how they, they dress is the obvious example, um, uh, uh, you know, whether or not they're wearing um, uh, a, a robe which in another context would be decided described as a dress and this yeah. yet the man wearing it within a culture where men typically do not wear long single flowing garments that are, that are, that are open at the base so um all of those all of those kinds of uh, areas i think are really really important to this and I, and i would agree with you but i think to identify as queer is certainly to um open up to the possibility of um uh of of kind of some kind of magical experience because it is about this understanding that the way one is in the world may uh, perhaps be very appear at any rate to be very different from the way that perhaps other people appear to be identifying the world I would say that you know queer identity is much more pervasive than most people um, perhaps or many people perhaps think um, but it, those personal experiences I think really kind of uh, invite us to ask a lot of interesting kind of questions and they're, they're, and, are, and thereafter to engage in practices which can reveal new sides to who we are 
and how we might be in the world, just like those objects in the museums when they're curated and, and, and engaged with, you know, successfully and well. But, yeah, absolutely. And just being open to other other times, other experiences and other perspectives. Yeah. So which are both that both of those concepts are very important in both queerness and magic. So, yeah, works for me. Um, so uh, over the years, um, I guess you've kind of forged your own path in a lot of ways in magic. And um, so how would you say that, you know, you've found magical traditions you've been involved in uh, to be accommodating or inclusive or affirming of, of queerness? So having, I mean, really good question. Having got involved in magic in the 80s, when of course um, the HIV pandemic was uh, was raging through the planet, mm -hmm. that was a very interesting kind of time because uh, it was a time in which there was uh, a lot of fear. There was things like, you know, Clause 28 within the, God, yeah. the conservative, conservative government, um, you know, enacted this uh, set of legislation about thou shalt, shalt not uh, promote uh, uh, um, particularly homosexuality, I think, is what they were against, but queer identity in schools and so on. Um, I remember it well. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All that kind of um, stuff. Um, and I think that certainly encountering Wicca, that was really interesting because um, Wicca, of course, has broadly speaking a, a geotheology um, of, uh, and that's normally, or normally, that's commonly um ident uh, expressed in the in terms of you know the horned god and, the, and, and perhaps a lunar goddess or whatever mm. and i remember kind of getting involved in this and thinking like this is kind of cool i like i like a lot of the ritual i like a lot of the people the, you know, the process is really good but there was something about that that um uh i suppose in terms of my own kind of sexual identity and feelings and also kind of almost a, a, a sort of philosophical and theological kind of level i felt that that um that way of seeing the world, um, particularly uh, when it's kind of linked to a sort of very Dion Fortune style of notion of polarity, you know, men are like this, men are from Mars and women are from Venus, and that's how the whole thing plays out. Mm. Um, that seems to me to be rather, rather one dimensional. And I appreciate that the, the ideas of polarity, you know, are, are way beyond that, but um, and, and can be conceptualized very, very differently. And I, I don't necessarily think there's any problem with a kind of um, uh, a kind of having this sort of um, hetero kind of uh, theology, but for me, I kind of wanted something that was that was um, more. I suppose as I saw it, more uh, there was more of a multiplicity or more of a, a sort of a multiple interpenetration of stuff. So even from quite a young age, I, I became very interested in the figure of Baphomet. That was one of the kind of um, uh, figures that I kind of encountered in in, in some of the um, work of Crowley and then uh, Life of Levi and various other people. So I became very interested in the idea of um, this uh, being, which was a kind of a deliberate like mashup of all of these kind of qualities. And then I suppose as I I worked within magic, I encountered things like um, the tantric tradition, which again, although uh, overtly so much of it looks quite kind of um, you know uh, hetero in terms of its styling. The a lot of the kind of uh, both the ritual approaches, a lot of the um, uh, people who've kind of written significant stuff on the, the, the subject, or a lot of the kind of um, the, uh, the the teachers of those traditions, and a lot of the kind of the deeper um, underlying philosophy of the um, tradition is much more. Uh, interesting and much more rich than just this, you know, there is the on and the off of the universe. Because these processes, particularly, say, tantrism, kind of works from this sort of non-dual perspective and then yeah. starts to kind of explore, well, how, you know, how does subject and object arise and all of these kinds of um, relational uh, things. So in terms of kind of my own practice, I suppose initially I found Wicca, you know, it was kind of, it was, it was good and it worked. But I've really kind of adapted and changed that over the years um, in terms of my own work. And I guess it's also about re recognition. You know, when we when we first see an image of, to take a tantric example, the, uh, uh, Shiva, and we, we see what looks at least to some degree like a bloke, um, a, a man, and then start to realise that actually that's just the kind of convenient 
label for a whole bunch of ideas mm. and indeed there are forms of that um, uh, spirit let's call it or principle uh, which are which are uh, expressed as female or as a hermaphrodite or whatever mm. so for me a lot of it's been the kind of a journey of starting off um, ex- uh, with a with a, a, a an encounter with these kinds of processes as being uh, noticing there are kind of apparent um, heteronormativity and then kind of as I've got deeper into that I suppose recognizing the the, the more subtle uh, and the more kind of complex um, aspects of those different traditions. So, so to some extent, it's about, you know, as Wicca, for example, has changed with things like inclusive Wicca and your work, um, that's also, uh, 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 as well as a creative process, is also kind of an unveiling of these, perhaps one might argue, deeper understandings of, of the, you know, we might symbolize things in a variety of different ways, um, uh, but below the, the, the symbol set, there's often much more complexity, much more diversity, much more subtlety than might appear on the surface. Mm, I think so. I mean, I was very fortunate to be uh, initiated into a coven where um, a huge number of the, my close relatives in the craft are bisexual. So that was that was a good start. And then also that we had the figure of Dreichten, Um you know, both male and female, and all of that. So, um, so I think for me that was a very queer figure. To, and also, I've always been a polytheist. So, um, with the occasional forays into atheism, but you know, I'm a sort of, I sort of flip flopped between the two over the years. And so, but polytheism is the go-to for me because it, um, there's so many different genders and and manifestations of deity and that um you can have all different archetypes and i totally agree with you about shiva because shiva was the first god i had an encounter with and um yeah i've always kind of seen him as in the same ballpark in the same way that i find odin to be very queer i also find that about shiva too so yeah, yeah um yeah. like there's that manifestation of shiva where he's um at one with shakti so Mm, yeah yeah where so does shiva got, start and shakti end exactly exactly i mean you know uh uh where the, the yes. figure is shown with the the, the with the, the kind of the two sides and also within tantrism the way that you've got this idea that shiva is yeah, to some extent this kind of like pure consciousness and then you've got um shakti which is the kind of like the manifestation of that in the form of the you know the ten thousand things and how these are re- this is really one one experience that we're talking about or one uh, reality that we're, 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 we're talking about um, but inevitably as human beings when when we when we define things and we come up with symbol sets so we can we can communicate with each other successfully as apparently discrete arisings of consciousness in the one universal field of bliss mm. uh, it's it's also quite easy to get the wrong end of the stick when 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 we say oh it, it, you know Shiva is a god you think okay what's well, what so she has you know some sort of cosmic penis that's you know it's that it's like oh, no God. like you kind of you kind of you you're, you're looking at the finger pointing yeah. to the moon, oh, the moon itself. now you come to mention it aha very good very good <laughs> so yeah i have actually seen um in uh, in birmingham the biggest shiva lingam in the uk in the in the Hindu temple there, and it is absolutely humongous. <laughs> so, Fantastic. There you go. <laughs> I, I suppose one of the other things for me is that is is um, because I'm interested in 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 history and I'm kind of uh, involved as I said with museums and things. Is that you start to get like um, in my practice, you, you you inevitably kind of get a bit of a long view. So I did some work in 20, 2011, 2012. Um, which was all about, um, uh, as part of the Cultural Olympiad, uh, which was about working with um, people between the ages of about, I think, 14 and 25. And we were finding ways to um, safely explore ideas of kind of uh, sexual identity, sexual health, um, you know, power and all these kinds of things. Uh, And so we were working with museum collections and bringing museum collections of one form or another into people within that age range to open up a a conversation about those kind of issues, which because they are um, 
very personal and sometimes very uh, difficult and problematic. It's much easier to talk about an object that we have between us than, than our own stuff. Mm. Um, and if, you know, if you'd gone to um, one of the collections we worked with was a collection owned by the Wellcome Trust, which is in a place stored in a place called Blythe House uh, in London. And um, they've got a whole series of objects from Pompeii. And some of the objects that they have are these enormous uh, marble uh, phalluses, enormous marble penises. And when you first look at them, you sort of, as a modern person, you think, well, these maybe these are from like a brothel or something or whatever. And then, of course, you know, anyone who knows a bit about classical history will know that um, penises were just lucky. So you just had a lucky penis on the front of your, your shop. That's what you did. You know, your shop yeah. might be a shop that sells fabric, but you just happen to have a lucky penis. That's what you do. You know, children would go into school wearing them and so on. And then what we were doing is we were bringing these objects to um to these young people and, and having discussions about like you know would it be cool to you know, there's your six-year-old child going to a nursery so they, they 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 they're wearing a little penis amulet and they say well no that would be you know social services would be called um and you can and it's very very interesting to explore those um those 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 things about how uh different things that uh are considered um acceptable or not or even sexual or not or, or the way that these things are understood over time and culture. Um, I know that one of the things, I don't want to kind of preempt one of your questions, but one of the things that we, we, you, you're going to ask, I think, was about like books, you know, or books, books are important. And I think one of the ones that I found really important in terms of um, thinking about uh, sexuality and, 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 and all those things was, was uh, Michel Foucault's work. Because um, Foucault really, you know, a great iconoclastic um, philosopher, um, and really interesting character um, in history of sexuality really kind of it explores this idea of even things like the notion of homosexuality and heterosexuality as being these essentially almost medicalized terms that, that start to to be kicked around in the lat, you know latter part of the Victorian period um, and so I think with with um, sex, sexual identity, queer identity, you know, all of those sorts of things. It's really interesting to kind of pan back and look at those mythological things like Odin, look at those, the way things were, were dealt with and have been dealt with differently and are dealt with differently in different cultures. Um, and, uh, you know, great example of that would be the way that on uh, Turtle Island in, the, in North America, um, and, uh, places like the United States, as we now know it, uh, sexual identity was uh, in many of the communities, again, as I understand it, uh, much more diverse than, yeah. you know, men and women. There's much more uh, subtlety. And again, that points to this thing about magic, about kind of subtlety, about fluidity, about change, about border crossing and boundary crossing. Um, so, yeah, it's it's uh, um, it's an interesting kind of field because it is also like very personal, you know, people's experiences of going out into the street and being shouted at or not shouted at or looked at or not looked at or whatever. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's an intensely kind of real thing as well as a, you know, a, a, an interesting philosophical idea to, to kick around. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely, I recall um, Quentin Crisp saying about how he would walk down the street in, I think, the 30s and 40s. Um, and one time he was just walking down the street and a woman just came up to him and slapped him around the face for being overtly queer. And it's just like, you know, that's almost unimaginable now, but that's what it was like back in the day. And it's like, you know, scary to think that we could ever go back to that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I think that, that I was really kind of aware of um, doing, doing this work um, uh, with the young people was, and, and I said this to them, but look, there is, um, to use it in another sense, there is no magical way, uh, there is no magical reason that things are the way they are now. They are mm. asserted and they are continued to be uh, um, made in every moment. So um, the way that we have uh, in, in, in some cultures anyway, in some places and times with, um, within perhaps the societies that we live in, a degree of, uh, 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 tolerance and understanding and inclusivity like that has to be maintained that doesn't mm. just you know uh, appear overnight um and it can change and it can change in ways that you know you and i probably wouldn't like yeah so kind of well, that's actively... it. i mean the, the 
the Whig interpretation of history is just wrong. Like, you know, the Whig interpretation of history being that idea that the the ruling elite will just hand us stuff on a plate because out of the goodness of their hearts. And it's like, no, every single positive piece of progressive um, anything has to have been struggled for by by decades of resistance. And therefore the maintenance of that, of what we see as like, oh yeah, it's perfectly normal in the status quo. The maintenance of that has to be constant as well. Um, and, and there can be strategies in that, like in magic, there can be practices and processes within that, which may be useful at some times, not at others. So Foucault kind of explores the idea of say, homosexuality being a kind of medicalized term and, and mm. to some extent problematizes that. Um, uh, 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 but also we know that the idea of this, of, of let's say sexual orientation being a thing which uh, exists uh, ac according to you know, some, um, uh, that that has been a useful idea. I remember once encountering a story of, I think it was in um, the United States where they did some research about um, uh, what they called uh, sissy boys. All right, mm. and they decided they did a bit of research to to, to um, that established essentially the boys who were uh, identified as sissy in some sense. You you actually had a really good chance of predicting that they would become uh, gay. Let's to use another piece of language. Mm. And one of the things that they uh, in one of the, uh, the this particular region in the United States where some of the research was done, because they could demonstrate the fact that there seemed to be almost a genetic or a predisposition component, they were able to argue round the editor of one of the newspapers in the region by saying, "Well, look, if you because he was a, he was a, a card carrying Christian," they said, "Well, look, if God has it would seem created a genetic predisposition." to this identity therefore it cannot be something that is against god's plan yeah now that seems like a kind of quite a twisted weird logic to me but nevertheless for this dude it was like oh yeah moment of revelation fine okay well that's all right then so so some yeah. of these things are like staging posts or processes strategies tactics you know that we might use in terms of opening up those spaces um but then moving from that to something like the the, the i think the more an increasingly commonly used idea, this idea of kind of queer identity, where you sort of say, well, you know, people have preferences and those preferences may be to do with body shapes or size or form or whatever, but they may also be significantly influenced by, you know, who they encounter, they may be radically changed, they may, you know, any number of things might happen. So we move from this idea of like a medicalized category of like heterosexual, homosexual, into this space that's more kind of fluid and at the moment in our culture that's a very very kind of seem, seems to me to be a very useful uh, strategy because it, it it tends towards inclusivity um and, and it tends to also potentially allow for good uh, alliances to be formed by people who you know perhaps have frankly you know being lovers with or in cultures with people who you know are very different mm. so um uh, those that yeah that these these kind of ways of thinking about these things have to be as you say you know maintained and 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 explored as well yeah i mean i recall a conversation i had with a christian where you know they had come to terms with their the under their understanding of gayness because they were like oh well you know this is what you said about the the editor that they'd taken that position that okay this is somehow biologically predetermined therefore um you know it's uh then god must must have done it that way um and then i was trying to put forward the idea that there's a fluidity and a and you know that that it's an identity as well as being you know there is obviously a biological component but it, there's also an identity and a fluidity and they were like oh so now you're saying it's a choice and i'm like no that's not what i said but you know uh -huh. if it, if it was a choice then they were like oh okay then it would be a disordered choice but if it's a predisposition then god must have intended it that way so um i was like okay i want both of those things right i want it, i want it to be biologically predetermined in some way but also that people have a choice within that uh, to, to be fluid um and I think we can have both, but it, it's interesting how in certain circles there needs to be that understanding that there's some biological component to it. So, mm. 
Mm, mm, mm. Um, yeah. I mean, people have different ways of sitting with these things, don't they? They have different ways of accommodating them to, to uh, depending on like where they are in their own storyline. You know? Yeah, um, and the thing is, it's all about pushing the Overton window, you know, sliding the Overton window across. And you have to bear in mind that uh, the on the left hand side or the the left hand side of the Overton window will be like, you know, charging ahead into progressive land, and the the right hand side is going. I'm not very comfortable here. <laughs> so you just got to keep shoving it in the right direction and hope. And of course, then there are those retrogressive forces that are trying to pull it back the other way. So yeah, it's a yeah, tug of war. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. I think, like you say, it requires constant effort to maintain the, the in, maintain that Overton window in the place where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, the whole situation with turfism in the UK right now that, you know, the, there's been a huge pushback against the Gender Recognition Act and a huge pushback against trans women being allowed in in uh, women only spaces and um, all kinds of things that have a material effect on the lives of trans women. Um, and, you know, that's been that whole thing has been spearheaded by a tiny group of radicals that have pushed the government back from from what they were in a reasonable position about you know are we going to give more access to to gender services for trans kids and things like this and they've pulled back from that position purely because of the pressure from this tiny group of of nut jobs and that's really disturbing you know so that's as you say constant maintenance of um and the fact that, of course, J.K. Rowling has jumped on that particular bandwagon has made it even harder for trans people to access the services they need. Um, so, you know, the, the fact that J.K. Rowling has stuck her oar in has, has had a damaging effect on people's actual lives, and that's mm -hmm. unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and all the people screaming about, oh, cancel culture and all of that, it's like, don't understand that the words can have a massive material effect on people's lives. So. I think I think as well it's also about about trying to find um, compassionate ways of addressing these issues because I mean I can totally like I can totally understand like uh, 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 I um, I remember kind of encountering uh, in the uh, particularly in the sort of the eighties the emergence of let's say within Wicca, kind of Dianic Wicca and like, you know, there's the idea of sort of, you know, women only spaces and, you know, um, all of those kinds of things. And uh, as someone who, you know, broadly speaking, identifies as a man, it's like, yeah, great, fantastic. You know, like I'm, I'm up for like diversity of practice and diversity of experience. So that's great. Um, and then I can see that people who, um, in, in whatever kind of way, whether it's kind of physiologically expressed or kind of um, uh, 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 primarily kind of like a, 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 a personal um, uh, uh, identity as a woman, for example, mm. uh, but biologically a man in the way that I understand myself to be, that that's a, that's a really problematic thing. That doesn't mean that it's like an either or. It means that there's a conversation that needs to be had, and the conversation it's really important that we find ways to have that conversation about how we manage those things in a way that doesn't fall into the trap of this or that yeah because you know i, I for me i can see that there would be like a, a great value in having spaces where women could speak as women um to other women about their experiences growing up as as girls right mm. that, that would make total sense and i can also see how there would be value in trans women being able to access some spaces where they could feel that they were part of this kind of uh, um, uh, gender identified community mm. what tends to happen is that i think you know part of this is kind of um something that's sort of curated within the media because we always like a kind of shock horror story and we never hear the story where somebody manages to kind of have lots of really nice conversations and figure out how they're going to deal with this on a personal level and it, mm. it never papers or or whatever yeah but to try and find ways of having those conversations which um admits to the fluidity and the, and the um the way that these boundaries inevitably will always be transgressed in one way or another um by by 
you know, actors in that space. And sometimes actual transgression will be something that's really kind of positive and beneficial for everybody. Sometimes it will only be beneficial for some people. Sometimes it will be, do you know what I mean? So it's like, it's, mm. it's, it's whether or not we can find ways going forward in that discussion to have those conversations that don't either retreat into, oh my God, I'm being cancelled or into a, a position of, well, no one's seeing me as a, for example, as a woman uh, um, in terms of my gender identity. Mm. So like we find ways of kind of getting around that. Um, that's one of the reasons that when, when, we, when I and um, the colleague I was working with were doing this work with objects, it was really interesting because we could have conversations very safely with a bunch of young people where they would, you know, really powerful stuff. But because we were talking about a, I don't know, medieval chastity belt, we weren't talking about what they did or did not do or who they did or did not see. We were talking about this thing over there. And sometimes mm. I wonder not that there are just other ways of having those conversations that aren't quite so adversarial and, yeah. and maybe, maybe admit to the, the um, plurality of the spaces we would like to have. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, the thing is, I think I'd like to see that, you know, if people want to have, a, I don't know, a workshop on menstruation or something, then just call it a workshop for people who menstruate. And then it's about the mystery of menstruation. And then, yeah. you know, I mean, personally, I'm quite happy to talk about menstruation and menopause and all that stuff in front of men and in front of people who don't menstruate. Um, because I think we need to, to get rid of the taboos around those things. Um, and I think uh you know i was listening to an old podcast by eddie buczynski the other day not eddie buczynski eddie gutierrez um talking about how the unnamed path uh was welcoming is welcoming and um, to trans and non-binary people and that was back in 2012 so um you know i think it, if you have a thing that has a focus on a specific mystery there's nothing to stop people who are interested in that mystery but don't actually have the biological bits of you know to match um can access that um in a uh, can access that as well and i don't you know i think it's this sort of very 1980s separatist kind of approach that says oh you can't have trans women in in women only spaces and it's like you know, I, I mean, will not. I personally will not enter a women-only space if it doesn't include trans women. I think. I think some. I think, and then and then that becomes like a conversation within those individuals within that kind of community. And but I think one of the things that we have to recognise is that the changes that have happened with all of this landscape, we are incredibly. Um, they're incredibly raw. They're incredibly fresh. That they're incredibly inviting and interesting, but they are also like really new. Like we don't know this stuff at all. Like when when Europeans turned up with uh, into um, uh, uh, North America and they started meeting those people and they started going, oh my God, there's there's this, like men and women and then there's like these other two spirit people and who like who what's what on earth's going on here, you know? If I I I was um again thinking about books I was kind of looking at some of the stuff on my bookshelf and I looked at there's a book called well, I'm sure you know called The Wise Wound yeah um, yeah um, so uh, Penelope Shuttle and Peter Redgrove and um, this was a book I can't remember when it came out was it I mean sort of I think it was you, late 80s because I know I 80s. bought I my remember, copy then well, yeah 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 totally I remember buying a copy because it was and one of the things in I think the introduction is that when they when the book was released there was no duodecimal classification for books about menstruation. Like it just didn't exist, it wasn't yeah. there, you know? So so the other thing I guess to recognize uh, uh, um, is that things have changed very fast and we're all, a lot of us, you know, are kind of um, trying to figure out this new, we're suddenly in this new big territory, like once upon a time there were men and women and then there were men and then there were women and then there were gay men and then eventually there were gay women and then eventually there was this like huge proliferation of identities and sexualities and polyamory and all this kind of stuff and it's really 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 recent that we've been having these overt cultural conversations about it of course this stuff has always happened in a variety yeah. of different ways either accepted or not accepted or policed or not policed by various forces within culture but we're new to this and i think that for me a lot of it come, kind of comes down to just being just being a little bit sort of generous with with um 
uh, ourselves and the other actors in the field to kind of go, well, yeah, we're all trying to figure this out, guys, because if this is like a, uh, an, uh, you know, I'm, I was like you, born in 68. Yeah. So the year before uh, we were born, male homosexuality was decriminalized with uh, consenting uh, adults over the age of 21 in private mm -hmm. British Isles. Something that radically upended, you know, arguably a couple of thousand years of, of you know, the, uh, the predominant position on uh, certainly, you know, the official position of um, mm. uh, uh, Christian ethics and certainly the kind of um, the legal situation in Britain as regards the, the, the law on these matters. And that's not long. You no. know, we might be 52, but that and, and, and for some people, that's like incredibly ancient and venerable. <laughs> but in the grand scheme of human culture, that's like what a couple of generations. Really. Yeah. It takes you know? and it takes seven generations for something to really shift. So, and I, when yeah. I talk to my kids, when I talk to, talk to my children, and I remember talking to to um, uh, to my eldest and kind of going, "Well, so you know, without getting too personal, like, what? How is it in your culture?" And he was just going, "Yeah, all, all all of us just kind of think they're all like pansexual," and he just that was it. That was it. It was like, "Yeah, whatever. We're all just like, you know, cool people who have sexuality." That's and, awesome. And, and 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 that was it. And that, I kind of went, you know, is there, a, you know, get, you know, within the limits of the parent-child relationship, is there is there more you can tell me about this? And he was just like, no, it's not really, it's not really a thing. You know, it's kind of like, I remember growing up as a kid and and um, you know having maybe one Asian guy in the school that I was in, maybe one Chinese dude. You know, uh, it was like it's an unusual kind of thing. And I had no like, you know, black friends, friends of color, friends from other kind of like, it didn't happen. You know, and um, that's not to say that, you know, racism has been vanquished, not by a long chalk, but mm. it does mean that, you know, I'm in, I'm, I work for an organization which has like an explicit policy of racism. Not only is it a, not a good thing, but it's something you should, you are actively supported in challenging within the workplace. Mm. That challenge doesn't have to be an antagonistic challenge. It might need to be. But it needs to be it needs to be something that's that's understood in the background of like this is relatively recent this is this is this is a new kind of thing for many people within culture um and there are all of those um beliefs and cross currents and ideas that are kind of a, a around in this field so i guess yeah just you know we need to we need to engage with those those discussions in a way that is uh, as far as possible about finding um, uh, alliances and points of contact and points of agreement and then kind of working out from there, I think, I'm trying to trying yeah. to see if we can do that as best we can. Yes, I think that a lot of this discussion has become far too polarised and it it's a case of a lot of the time, you know, like you say, find alliances. There are people who are at, at the, there are extremists in the in the field pushing things in a particular direction but um you know i think the way to, the way forward is to find alliances with people who take a more moderate view so and some of those alliances can be beautiful I mean, if you look at the alliances that existed between um the miners during the miners strike in britain and some of the gay community yes you know like this is you know, communities gathering together and, and finding, you know, mutual support who, who you know, one would, uh, it would be, um, it's perhaps to some degree surprising to find yeah. those alliances emerging, but also how incredibly beautiful, how lovely, lovely, lovely to see stuff like that, you know. Yeah, kind of I mean, I just, uh, the, the film Pride that documented that was just exactly. I was just absolutely loved that film in in every way it was just yeah. so fantastic yeah, yeah absolutely um yeah so then I had uh, another question which was um about your personal practice and um you know do you practice with group or on your own or um yes um well so I'm I'm part of um, a network of uh, practitioners, chaos magicians, part of a couple of networks, but I suppose the one that, that I often speak about is the um, the Magical Pact of the Illuminates of Sanatiros, which is a triple word score if you get it in Scrabble. Um, <laughs> and uh, so the IOT, so we're a group of, of, um, of, of chaos magic practitioners. And we, we gather together when it's not a pandemic 
uh, in physical space and these days uh, online. Um, and that is a very, very diverse community and it's, it's incredibly in inclusive of, um, oh, I, 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 I believe and I would say that the community aspires to be very inclusive of, of uh, queer identities. Um, and certainly with uh, my own kind of practice, you know, I work um, in with kind of small group uh, settings. And it's something that I suppose I bring to my practice in, in the sense that um, a lot of the kind of uh, entheogenic lineages that I've kind of worked with. Um, so some of them have got quite a, uh, a sort of standard issue heteronormative way of, of, of talking about the universe. Uh, for example, in sacred songs or in uh, ritual processes, you know, the men stand on this side, the women stand on that side and so on. And where where I'm able to and where where it's appropriate to in my own practice, I tend not to do that kind of stuff, you know. Um, so even with the early Wiccan exp um, uh, group that I was part of, we would do, you know, the drawing down of the goddess into somebody who identified as a man or whatever you like. Yeah. You know, maybe it doesn't sound like a big deal now, but at the time it was like, whoa, what are you doing? Well, how's this going to work? Um, so my own practice, I think, very much in kind of includes those, those I, I, I hope and I aspire to include those, those sensitivities for my own benefit and the benefit of the people around me. Um, a lot of my practice this day, these days looks quite, I mean, my daily practice is things like, you know, body work and meditation and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, a lot of my practice kind of looks quite, mm, and again, it's a problematic word, shamanic, let's call it for argument's sake these days. Um, but um, yes, yeah, because I'm, I'm more and more interested in styles of ritual, which although they may have structure uh, where, you know, we're not reading off of scripts, really, we're, yeah. we're trying to say what moves us in the moment, or we're trying to kind of create spaces where that that authenticity can kind of uh, emerge in a in a shared space. That's my um, favourite sort of ritual. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 the way forward. I mean, I've you know I've done ritual, which is much more, very much more. You know, learn learn the text. You know, I go and stand in the west and say some stuff. You stand in the east and you say some stuff. And you know, that's great. That's great. And I'm you know pretty familiar with with uh, a number of um, styles that are like that, but. I suppose, yeah, uh, my pet practice tends to get sort of pared down these days. It gets, it, in a way, it gets simpler and simpler, perhaps. It's always good. Makes it easier to do. Makes it easier to uh, do. That like answer it. that one all right? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, no. perfectly good. <laughs> good. Um, so tell us a bit about your website and blog. Oh, do you, is, this, is this a marketing this, this bit? Is where you get to plug stuff. Oh, oh well, right, I've, okay. I've actually missed out the, the question about the favourite book, but we'll... Come back to well, that. I, I, I'll, I'll mention one because I, I mentioned I mentioned Foucault, and I think for me, um, there's books about kind of queer magic. There's I've mentioned your work actually as well um, uh, with inclusive Wicca. I think that for me, a lot of the books that have been really interesting have been books that have been about um, uh, gender identity uh, in across different cultures. Uh, um, uh, processes of kind of fluid identity um, uh, in terms of, uh, say, male cross-dressing, for example, very interesting, uh, in terms of particularly with that way, again, that shades off into like, you know, shamanism and this kind of liminality and, you know, uh, these these kinds of ideas of kind of blending the, the, the multiple sort of identities or sexualities into one form or figure. Um, uh, I guess one of the first ones that I encountered that really sort of sparked my interest um, in terms of the contemporary literature was Raven Caldera's uh, Hermaphrodites. Mm. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, that was one of the ones that I remember kind of reading this and going, ah, oh, this is a really interesting kind of exploration. I think it's, I think that there's, um, like with the conversation about Shiva, it's very easy to look at a, a, a deity, a spirit and say, oh, that's a man or that's a, that's a woman or whatever. And, it, and in fact, you know, even in the classical tradition, lots of these figures actually have, you know, different, different forms, different gendered kind of uh, forms. Um, mm. and, and the same is even true, you know, in um, uh, ancient Egyptian uh, mythology as well. Very often you've got a god who gets known uh, and then there's the goddess form 
of the same spirit, the same kind of deity. So Raven Caldera's work, but but I suppose an earlier influence and one that I maybe was more, even more important, was reading a, a thing called um, Green Egg magazine and encountering the work of um, uh, the lovely lovely people of the uh, Church of All Worlds. Um, and they're, in, they're interested in kind of, um, you know, polyamory and um, uh, sexual fluidity way before it was fashionable or being talked about in, in wider circles. And I remember kind of encountering that stuff and thinking, oh, I really like this. This is something that goes beyond what I, at that point, understood as the duo of theology of Wicca into something that's much more rich and strange and weird and exciting and kind of how I kind of see myself. So um, yeah, all of that uh, early early stuff in the Church of All Worlds was very important. And the books that they pointed towards, of course, you know, things like Strange in a Strange Land, and then the whole proliferation of, of polyamory texts that have come from, from that direction, yeah. Mm. Yes, and uh, um, Morning Glory, Raven Hartzell and her uh, piece on the um, a bouquet of lovers. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Very important. Yeah. Very, very important thing it's like okay right how are we going to practically do this polyamory thing <laughs> you know how are we going to make yeah. it work yeah. i mean yeah. how did people do it before google calendar came along i have no idea <laughs> 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 you have to have a really good diary um yes and uh right so yeah lovely lots of rich sources there um so yeah tell us about your blog and website so, so to plug your stuff I've got plugging stuff, right? Okay, so um, I've got a blog, as you know, the blog of Baphomet.com, which has been running since 2011. There's loads of stuff on there, um, uh, all kinds of different sort of aspects. It's, it's predominantly um, me and um, uh, a guy called Steve D, who I work with quite closely, you know, magically, and and uh, and also on, on on writing projects and so on. He and I obviously did the, obviously did the Chaos Craft um, uh, work. In fact, you know, our names are on the book, but um, uh, Nikki Weird was also, you know, very, very much part of that story, and she obviously does all the kind of, you know, the the editing and typesetting of that of of, of that text, which is which is great. Um, the uh, other things that people who are listening to this might be interested in, there's a book that's come out subsequent to that called The Fool and the Mirror, and that's got a lot of stuff about um, sexuality and identity, and uh, that that has quite a lot of kind of queer uh, sort of content associated with it. Um, and I've just just finally managed to drag myself through organizing my own kind of website so people can um, go and look at julianvane.com which is just you know where I've kind of grouped loads of stuff together and there's kind of links out from there to some of the online teaching that I do and mentoring and various other things um, so that's probably the easiest way to, 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 to find me these days and then you know nice and friendly people can find me on Facebook and Instagram and you know all the usual stuff excellent and Twitter as well and Twitter occasionally, yeah. I mean, Twitter, Twitter seems to me to be like just just um, a place where people barrack each other most of the time. So I so so I've seen friendly things on there as well. But I kind of I kind of like uh, um, uh, Instagram and Facebook is probably where I'm where I'm, I'm mostly to be found uh, these days. But yeah, if, you, if people go to julianbain.com, then they'll they'll find links to all the other bits and bobs. Awesome. And to the My Magical Thing series that you were very generously part of as well, which is great. Yes, it's very, it's very wonderful, My Magical Thing. And actually, I was thinking when you were talking about using an object as an intermediary thing, um, you get to reveal a whole different side of somebody and what they're about just by going, OK, I'm going to talk about this object. Um, and I've loved watching the My Magical Thing series. Um, so I watch them when I'm doing my exercise bike in the morning. <laughs> so. Well, there's another, there's another, uh, another three uh, in the can at the moment, um, and hopefully there'll be more to come of those, uh, yeah, uh, over the course of this year. Awesome, yeah, and there is, they have a lot of them there, so um, I think I'm going to have plenty to do on my exercise bike, so it's good. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> so yeah, if you find me uh, commenting on or liking them at sort of random times, you'll know why. Ah, that's why. <laughs> it's like, hang on, why did she watch that one a year later than the other one? Yeah, like that was why. So yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for what has been a really rich and fascinating interview. It's been great. Um, so uh, everybody check out Julian's work uh, at the aforementioned places. And uh, thanks for coming and blessed be. Yvonne, thank you so much. Blessed be. Blessed be. <laughs>